I am here with B.J. Daniels, Seattle Seahawks Super Bowl winning quarterback. Uh, even if you didn't win the Super Bowl as far as playing on the field, but you still had the, the opportunity of going out there and, and playing Super Bowl 48. Uh, also, I'm Angel Martinez with Martinez and Company, also with Riptide Media. And uh, B.J., is, as we tried once before, having a conversation and uh, certain things end up happening. But um, going back to, I guess, from the very beginning, Mm-hmm. where you were born and raised in Tallahassee, Florida. Right. Went to Lincoln High School. Yeah. Uh, at one point as well, where you threw in one game six touchdowns for 723 yards, yeah. which I think is crazy to even think about as a high school athlete. But leading up to before we even get to USF, uh, a personal life story ended up happening in your life. Mm-hmm. What was it like as far as your childhood where you knew which direction you wanted to go and then leading up to that game how did you know you were going to have just such an impactful game yeah um I don't know I mean I I think ever since a young kid I've always been very competitive Uh, I was the person that would cry uh, if we would lose anything if I would lose anything in any sport any car game any flag football game when I was a six-year-old to playing you know basketball when I was 10 uh, I can just think of many many moments where you know I just had this competitive spirit of nature uh, within me Um, I remember even playing in the backyard with my dad, playing catch. And uh, my goal was always throw it over his head. I would never throw it to him or I would throw it over the fence um, just to prove, you know, how strong I was or, um, you know, it it just always has been engraved in me. And, and, you know, leading up to that high school game, you know, I, I always think back to, you know, my freshman year of high school. You know, I'm 13 years old. I'm the backup quarterback on varsity. And um, during that season, I get a chance to play after the fourth game of the year. And I've been a four-year starter in high school ever since. So that senior year game that I had, um, I just remember just being in the zone. Um, I remember not wanting to let my team down. I remember playing against Pensacola Pine Forest, who was extremely uh, good at the wing tee offense. So they ate up a lot of clock. Uh, you know, running the ball all the time. And then on top of that, they had some really good running backs. So every time they scored, you know, I took it as a challenge. Um, We were in the spread offense. So, um, you know, very important for me to be able to hit the receivers when they're open and in timing. And it was a little more difficult for me to rather than just hand the ball off and get three yards in a cloud of dust like Pensacola Pine Forest. So I just took it it as a challenge, you know, and I just uh, every time they scored, I wanted to score. And, uh, that game ended up being an overtime game, a double overtime game, and I think we won 42 to 44. Uh, I think it was that close. So it was it was a it was, it was a surreal moment for me and something I am proud of. Now I'm going to go off camera here for a second because the one thing that we talked about beforehand too was, and I want people to understand this. So here's where where this is going. So. We're walking through, coming out of your office, mm-hmm. and we're looking at where the coaches' offices are. We're looking at the Hall of Fame as far as the, right. the hallway. We look at the, the players and athletes mm-hmm. that we've seen that come here from USF. Right. As we're walking and talking, and you're explaining to me everything, we come down to the locker room. Mm-hmm. Right. On this side of the house that everybody can see right now is the course of person who's doing the interview and the conversation with you. On the back side, as we're walking through, I'm just thinking, like, I'm with B.J. Daniels, <laughs> Seattle Superhawk, you know, Seahawk. And, and it's the, the best feeling because you don't get to talk to someone that has number one Super Bowl experience, even if it was only one that you guys ended up going to, which you did go, you know, the following year as well. Right. But to be able to play in a game like that, and the one question that I remember asking you was, at the corner end of the end zone, mm-hmm. when you look at it, and we're going to get back to USF days here, and you had said that no one had ever asked you the question before. Mm-hmm. Being at the that corner part of the end zone and looking out into everybody who's there, because you know there's not only is it about forty thousand plus in the stands, right. you're talking about millions upon millions of people looking in, listening in on the radio because it's worldwide, it's the biggest game ever in right. the U.S. and all around the world. Yeah. That feeling, walking out of the tunnel, knowing, and we're gonna flash back to on, on how you got the call. What was that feeling like, knowing that everything that we're going to lead up to from your high school career to your college days to now getting a call and you're finally there, what was that feeling like coming out of that tunnel? I mean, it was amazing. Um, You know, a a blessing and a dream come true. I never thought I would have that opportunity. Um, My senior year breaking my ankle, um, you know, in college and and not, you know, thinking that, I'm thinking that football was over, um, essentially. Um, you know, I spent from 23 years old to, or six to 23 years old of a dream. Uh, you break your ankle right before you, you know, are about to get, you know, drafted, make that next step. 
um, you know, it was, it was it was heartbreaking. It really was. And, um, you know, so dreams crushed. And, and then for a reality or a dream to come true, um, to be able to, you know, my first uh, preseason is fun. It's cool. But, you know, you really don't have that real feel of a real National Football League game on national television until you come out of the tunnel and Aaron Rodgers is standing right next to you. He's running out of the tunnel. Uh, that was my first experience, really. You know, I played in preseason games, but to be in Candlestick uh, with the San Francisco 49ers, uh, first, uh, you know, regular season game, um, a playoff type of atmosphere. Um, you know, the year before, the 49ers had beat Green Bay. Colin Kaepernick ran all over him um, in the NFC Championship game. And now, here we are, our first game of the season. And, uh, you know, Aaron Rodgers coming out of the tunnel and the candlestick, candlestick is rocking. I mean, it's... It's uh, something I never thought or envisioned. Um, I dreamed about it, but it's different when you're actually in that moment. It's It's got to be a surreal feeling, too, because, again, it's, as we talked about prior to even having the, the conversation today, is that everything that you had to go through in order to get to that point, you know, whether it being adversity, whether it being, you know, just life challenges, you also had a moment where, as an athlete, because you know as much as everybody else, once your name starts getting out there, it's almost like that that target that you don't want because right. it's the people that are either jealous or don't like where you're going mm-hmm. and because they didn't work as hard as you did then it's almost like well then what can I do to take away that person from not excelling right you had an experience uh, prior to to getting in, in into the NFL where you had someone almost take away that dream and right. and I would like for you to share with everyone that experience that it could have been a different outcome we could have been right. talking here today <laughs> yeah absolutely um so yeah my my uh my freshman year we play against Florida State uh and everyone recognized me for that game you got a, a kid that grew up in Tallahassee grew up in a dorm room grew up watching Charlie Ward Derek Brooks uh dreaming to be a you know to play football in that stadium of Dope Campbell Stadium um which is now at Bobby Bowden Field and um, you know, I always had dreams and goals of, of being one of those guys. And uh, to have an opportunity to not get, uh, not receive a scholarship from them, but then go to USF, go to USF and start as a freshman and then go back to Tallahassee and play against, you know, the Goliath of Florida State and Bobby Bowden and Jimbo Fisher. And, you know, that, that's, that, uh, that mystique uh, to go against them and win uh, was amazing uh, for me. But on the backside of that coin, um, it put my name in a spotlight where people would recognize me in places that I would go, and I absorbed it. Um, it was something I had never experienced before on a national level, because uh, I have to remember this game was on national TV. So, um, you know, people all over the country saw a 14-year-old, you know, an 18-year-old uh, go in Doe Campbell Stadium who had no shot, no chance to a freshman and go in there and beat, you know, one of the top teams in the country. Any time during the game? Not at all. I'm not really, a, you know, a nervous person. I was just, you know, excited to get out there and, and uh, you know, play hard for my team. You know, all week I've been preaching, uh, you know, to my teammates. It's not about me. Um, it's about the Bulls stepping up and, and, and making a name for ourselves. So, so, you know, the homecoming or whatever you want to call it, uh, it's, it was nice to come back home and play in front of my fans and, and friends and family. So, you know, the backside of that coin is, is you know, just, you know, being in the wrong place, wrong time. Um, myself, my, right after that game, not, not too long uh, after, I was robbed at gunpoint. Um, and I think that the people that, uh, uh, you know, were, that helped me in that position uh, expected me to have something. And I don't know if that was, fi- they wanted to get financial gain, um, which I'm assuming, but, you know, I was a college athlete, so it was, before NIL, so no, no, I wouldn't get paid for name, image, and likeness. Right. Um, you know, but I was hanging out with, you know, you know, rappers and um, different uh, celebrities and things like that. And, um, you know, they already had, they already knew how to move. And I was still new to the game. So, you know, staying late, you know, parking behind buildings, um, you know, uh, you know, not really understanding the environment um, definitely taught me a lesson that I'll never forget. Um, I walk. I walk outside of a, a party, and I have four of my teammates behind me, and I'm, I'm in the front um, of them, and I'm the driver, of, you know, of my car, and, um, you know, I'm walking in front of them. These four guys are behind me, and I just remember hearing feet, just a bunch of just commotion and chatter, and people just running, and I remember turning around, and uh, there were four guys that were holding a pistol in, in front of my face, um, you know, in that moment, you know, I, I don't believe in. Uh, you know, in the movies, they have the white light. Right. 
uh, it was just crazy for me because at the end of the day, that's what I felt like I saw. Uh, I didn't hear anything. I didn't see anything. I, body just completely went numb in my opinion. But one thing I remember is um, I was just throwing things out of my pockets because I didn't know what they wanted. Um, I just didn't want them to take take me, uh, you know, in my life. And uh, it was it was a crazy moment for me because um, I made it out of that situation. Uh, I made that situation completely healthy. Um, no bumps, no bruises. Obviously, I'm still here today to uh, be able to tell that story. Um, but uh, right after that, what people don't realize is, uh, you know, with me being in the spotlight, I didn't want to call the police. I did not want it to report it. Um, I did not want it to hit the media uh, that I was in the wrong place at the wrong time at 3 o'clock in the morning just being a regular college student, um, you know, trying to enjoy my time. Um, and, uh, you know, less than three hours later, this happened at 3 o'clock in the morning, at 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, I found my car keys. They were in the bushes somewhere. <laughs> I got in my car. I was by myself. All my teammates had left. Um, you know, once they scattered, they all disappeared. So I don't know what happened. You know, I thought something could have ha- happened to them. Right. Uh, but then at 7 a.m., I have to go to mandatory breakfast uh, with the football team. Uh, because we have we have to check in for breakfast, and then at uh, eight o'clock we have meetings, at nine o'clock we have practice, and I'm having to go about my day naturally like nothing ever happened. And uh, but when I saw my teammates at breakfast, we all kind of looked at, at each other and just was uh, we were thankful uh, with a sigh of relief, uh, you know, that we all were there um, and nothing had happened to anybody. But uh, but yeah, it was a it was a def- definitely a scary moment for me. Did anybody know, other than you guys, what ended up happening that evening? Did, did anybody ever find out, like, what happened or that you guys were in that situation? No, no, no. It was definitely something we, uh, we, we've we carried with us for a long time. Um, where I am right now today in my journey as far as trying to help people, uh, I'm, I get excited to talk about it because I get an opportunity to share uh, and kind of help people navigate. You know, there, there's, you know, we have players here at USF now, and, um, there are opportunities where they could be targets in the community um, and just, you know, maneuvering the right way, going the right places, knowing not to overstay your welcome. Um, you know, when the lights come on, it's time to go. When the lights come on, it, you should have left 10 minutes ago. Right. Uh, don't park in cert- certain areas. Um, you know, just just all those things I think are very valuable and important, especially in today's climate. These college players are now getting paid just because it's posted on Instagram or ESPN everyone sees that not just the people that follow you right that you think are supporting you uh keyword think you know so um you know just helping these 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 young players i'm just thankful that all of my experiences most of them i get to provide them with examples it's not like i'm telling them what to do i can actually show them the blueprint of this did not work this was not right this is where my girlfriend broke up with me this is where i threw an interception this is these are my pitfalls, uh, and, and how do you prepare for that when those things come? Yeah, so. there's a unique story that that we're gonna get to as far as the, the call, how it happened, where yeah. you were, yeah. uh, where your family was, which is it's a real uh, unique story. But it, when you talk about, you just mentioned now that you're able to talk about certain things. Mm-hmm. One thing I think that what's being disconnected in today's society is C.J. Stroud after winning right. the game for the Houston Texans. First thing he said was, "I thank God." Right. right, And so now it seems like we can't say that anymore because it's taken out. Like, oh, my God, how can you say, thank God? You know, what does God have to do with anything? If people want to talk about that now as athletes, because we all do it. I don't right. you know if you wake up in the morning for me, I'll just, you know, personally, I always thank God because he gives us another day right. to come out here and get things right. If yesterday was a bad day, we can always, you know, just disregard it and just ask God, hey, you know, Yesterday was bad or it was good or it was indifferent, whatever the case may be. But the reset starts the minute that we awaken. Right. And because of him, he's the one that opens up our eyes in the morning to say, okay, I'm blessing you, Angel and BJ, with another day so you guys can come out here and get that stuff straight. How important is it that we have to make sure, even if we're not preaching to anybody, right. but for people to still understand if it isn't from God, all of this wouldn't happen because of him. Yeah, I mean, that's it's... it's uh first thing that comes to mind is when I was in college I wore only God on my on my face on the eye black we could write on write a message on it I know Tim Tebow was famous for John 316 on his on his face but I always put only God and and what that meant for me was any and everything I've ever accomplished it was because of him 
Um, one of the most powerful things I've, you know, and when I talk to players now here at USF, they also give me things too. Um, so there was a defense lineman um, named Emmanuel Hickman and um, randomly left a message on my on my table. And it was take I, I, the word I out of it and, and put he. And what that meant as we, me and him discussed it, um, you know, all the things that we say that I've done or I've accomplished, he allowed me to do that. He put me in position to do that. Um, he gave me the platform to present this or to show his talent or the way he's blessed me. So, um, you know, th- that that's how important I think speaking at least on God is is, is just acknowledging the, the presence and the place that you have because you wouldn't have it without him. Um, you know, and even here today, I mean, I've, you know, post-NFL, I've prayed, you know, for the NFL dream once I thought that was over. I prayed mo- on multiple occasions just for years just to get back here. And the best part about that is I think throughout my journey, I had no idea that he was preparing me for this. Um, you know, and I'm excited, you know, to, to talk about, you know, my journey and, you know, where God has brought me from, um, you know, my dedication and when I'm on track, when I'm on track, how I'm being blessed, not when I deviate and right. do my own thing and it doesn't right. work. But when I'm on track and I'm in my purpose, things, doors just open. Uh, opportunities just come. Um, I'm able to have peace when things don't go right. Um, Cause it's not, no, there's no guarantee everything's going to work out in your favor. That's true. Uh, you know, but the, the peace that you can have when it doesn't, um, it's something I think is um, incredible. I really do. I'm here again with BJ Daniels. I'm Angel Martinez with Martinez and Company and Red Tide Media. And the great thing when I'm talking to BJ, the entire time that we've been together is, it's the humbleness. And that's the reason why I bring up God, because we've all gone through different walks and paths of life. Right. And when the time that we spoke from inside your office, again, going through the hallway, mm-hmm. running the coach, going to the locker room, some of the fellows are out there hanging out, and we're seeing all the upgrades that happened. This magnificent building, yeah. which to me, it's incredible. Even the surround system. I mean, I'd rather stay here and, and watch a game in here just from the surround system. But yeah, you know, it's just... You, you stayed humble. You seem like you remained humble from the time you played. And by the way, if anybody wants to see, look up B.J. Daniel's picture. During the parade, the Super Bowl parade, the man doesn't age. It's the same. <laughs> no different. <laughs> but, you know, that's the, the beauty of things, though, because as, as we continue to get older, mm-hmm. you know, we hope that we remain humble. There's, you know, we have bad days. Everybody knows this. There's right. times when you wanted something to happen right then and there. It's like, mm-hmm. it, why didn't this happen? Because it wasn't intended to happen at that point in time. Absolutely. You've taken a different role here with USF where you started in 2021 being part of the football team, which you are to a certain extent, but you decided to challenge yourself and do something different. So if you want to share with everyone before we get into it, because I I love the the family story when it comes to the draft, and that's coming up next. But to to share with everyone, why did you decide to now challenge yourself yet again, be back here at your alma mater? Yeah, um, you know, I did think, I thought coaching was easy. Um, and I really felt like, you know, as a coach, um, you could teach X's and O's all day. I mean, there are people who have never played the game, but they've studied the game, they've prepared for the game, um, you know, they, they, and they can regurgitate information. They can talk about how to do this or how to do that or do a three-step drop or X's and O's and coverages. And for me, it was kind of like, okay, I can do that too. Um, but one thing that I have that's very valuable is my lived experience. So the simple fact that beyond just football, I've also had to live a life outside of this football field, outside of these 100, you know, 100 yards. So, um, you know, me passing the message along to what my experiences were um, throughout my career, whether it's financial literacy, dealing with relationships, dealing with your family, dealing with financial advisors, uh, dealing with, um, you know, uh, agents, um, you know, all those things, I think, are where I can pass along and help someone else out because they actually can hear me based off of my passion, my 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 vision, um, when I share stories about what I've done and how it worked out or how it didn't. Um, I think those are more valuable because I can use that because it's rare. Um, a lot of people can coach football. Um, I, want to, I really want to help, you know, coach people in the game of life, like tell them... Um, how to be better and do better and, and stay in the league longer or, you know, take care of their bodies or um, avoid situations that they should, you know, shouldn't be involved in. Um, and I think the biggest thing, especially now, um, priorities. Um, you know, my priorities have changed. 
uh, when my priorities were in the right space, then I was in the right space. And I think with, with now, these players have so many different things that they can get distracted with that I didn't have to deal right. with. I didn't have to deal with NIL. Uh, social media was not the biggest thing in the world. You know, these players now, you know, not just at South Florida, but anywhere, all over the country, you got to think about, you're already nervous to play in the game, but then you also have to worry about being the next meme. Yep. The next hashtag, you know, the, the next, you know, snippet or clip of a video of you making a mistake, not being an imperfect person, making a mistake on the football field, which then you're now judged as a human being. Um, those are all things that these these players face, men and women, um, here at USF and in our community. And I, I just really feel like it's more important for me to be an example of, you know, how to handle those things rather than teach you how to play a sport. There's a million people that can do that. The, the common thing is, which I enjoy, is when we walk through the building, mm -hmm. how many people came up and they, they said hi to you? Hey, BJ, even if they see you every day, yeah. there's a difference between how also people say hi. You know, we, we hear it when HR now has to say, like, if you, if you see a lady, there's a certain way you can say hi anymore, but you can't say it in a whole different way because the way the text is thrown. But when we hear and watch everyone as we walk through the campus, again, coming from your office down to the field here, mm -hmm. People that say hi is because you've done something. Even if you, the word hi meant something to them, you've done something to connect with them. Right. Even if you haven't been here for years. And we know that you know the athletes, they come, they're here three to four years, right. unless they get drafted early and they're out. But I think that as you just stated, that connection that you're making, being back here and talking to all these athletes, I think it'll be more, for me, I will say for USF, for you to be around here for hopefully the next 10 years, maybe the next 20 years, because you being the experienced one coming here from USF, obviously starting Tallahassee, but then coming here, going to the pros, and then coming back here again. You've lived that full circle of life where you can come back and, and share with these athletes. And now that you're seeing the experience, just like me, even though <clears throat> I'm younger than BJ, don't believe that. <laughs> but because of now seeing social media, the way it's taken off, you bring up a lot of great points because unfortunately, whatever we do outside, away from these cameras, and we feel like, okay, we can say and do whatever we want to, it's different now because you could be, let's say if, you know, if Michael Irvin came in and talked to you mm -hmm. and you guys had a moment down in Ybor City, before that camera turns on, you guys may have said something that's way in the past that had nothing to do with the future today, right. but it takes one person to whip out that phone and say, mm -hmm, okay, y'all yeah. just hear what, what BJ and Michael was talking about. Mm -hmm. And that part to me, it sucks because you now have to explain yourself in so many different forms and fashion of no, y'all took that out of context. That's not what it was meant and how it was said. So you bring up a very valuable point with a lot of these young athletes that they have to deal with that. And it's unfortunate. Yeah. The part that I'm gonna really enjoy in this conversation now, what you guys wanna tune into this one really good is that as you came up and you're now in the NFL, right. you're now becoming part of the draft. There's a whole experience that leads up to the draft of whether, you know, what to wear, what not to wear. Yeah. Where am I going? Oh, yeah. Am I going to New York? Because that's where you guys all went originally. Mm -hmm. By the way, if you guys are listening to the uh, fire alarms, unfortunately, the air show... Uh, they're having practice, so it's sending off ringtones, it's sending off fire alarms. So that's what you guys, uh, unfortunately, are hearing here. But when it came to the draft, it had to be, when again, as you think about your entire career now leading up to that point, because mm -hmm. it's not a guarantee right. that you can make it. You could be a walk-on. You know, you might be a, a designated signee, you know, a couple of weeks down the road. Mm -hmm. But leading up to that night, you've already worked your butt off right. in high school. You've done it here at USF. You've done everything that BJ could possibly do for himself to now get him to that next level. Right. Did you decide to go to New York or where did you decide to be at? And then when the call came, what happened? Yeah, I mean, humbly speaking, everyone has the idea and dream of going to New York, uh, getting invited to the Combine. That's 100% what I thought was going to happen with me, playing in the, uh, the Senior Bowl um, or even the East-West Shrine game. Uh, none of those things happened. Um, my senior year, when I broke my ankle, I missed the last three games of my senior year. So from my perspective, you know, you have a six-year-old um, who wants to play in the NFL one day, um, who grows up to be a 23-year-old, who has pushed sleds, run up hills, who's done everything that every coach has ever asked them. The harder you work, fight through pain, 
Um, you know, if you want to make it, you need to do X, Y, and Z. And I've done all these things that from Pee Wee, high school, college has all taught me. And I've had multiple coaches. Um, and I get to the point where I break my ankle, then it's like, okay, well, now what? Um, do I just go ahead and pursue my degree in criminology and become a FBI agent? You know, you know, like what, what's next? Um, so for me, um, you know, I remember uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday sitting in my living room with my girlfriend at the time, her family, and my parents, and my two little sisters, and uh, being very uneasy because I'm sitting in a room full of people who are excited for me, who love me and care about me. And I'm sitting there nervous because I know that my ankle is not fully healed. I know that there's probably an expectation that I have on myself to want to be in the NFL, and rightfully so, thinking that I deserve that opportunity because of my body of work. Um, what I've put into it, you know, especially with my college career and how that went, um, you know, beating Florida State, Notre Dame, Clemson, Miami, West Virginia, Syracuse, Rutgers, like on a natural, like not just once or twice. This this happened consistently over a four year period, um, you know, four year starter and, you know, second in all time in Big East. I'm like, OK, why not? OK, well, what's what's counting against me? Well, I have a broken ankle. I'm a 5'11 quarterback and I'm an African-American quarterback. So on top of those things, I'm sitting there like, okay, well, man, even if I was healthy, I don't know how this would work out. And I'm sitting there, and Thursday, my name doesn't get called. Uh, Friday, my name doesn't get called. Um, and we're sitting there glued to the TV all day. I'm sitting hoping that, hoping that my phone rings, and it's my agent, or maybe it's an NFL team. And I'm watching these guys that I played against get drafted before me. Um, I played with getting drafted before me um and uh, I got phone calls from Philadelphia um Seattle called me um and they they, they said hey we, we're we're looking at you this round so be stay by your phone and be prepared so uh, they were flirting they were flirting with me and uh I didn't appreciate that uh you know but at the end of the day um Saturday came and it was the seventh round so obviously the, the pizza and the wings and everything we got on Thursday was now cold. Friday, you know, it was leftovers. And Saturday, we're just trying to figure out, you know, what's going to happen. Um, and um, I ended up getting a phone call in the seventh round from um, Jim Harbaugh. And, uh, you know, he was the first, it was the first time I had talked to a head coach. So every other call I had gotten was from a scout. Um, when I heard it was Jim Harbaugh, I immediately got up off the couch. I went into my, my mom's bathroom, and I closed the door. And I said, Coach, what's going on? How you doing? Um, and uh, he asked me, do I want to be a 49er? And uh, I broke down crying. Um, you know, I said, of course. You know, and uh, before I had the opportunity to even walk out that bathroom and go and tell my family, um, the way it works is they call you first, and then your name comes across the screen. Right. Um, while I'm in the bath, I didn't even see my name go across the screen. I'm in the bathroom. My family's in the living room. They saw my name go across the screen. So they think that they're running to come tell me something. And uh, I already knew it. And, and it was just this moment of no one really said anything other than just, you know, my mom grabbed me. I just remember, you know, hugging her so tight and, and her hugging me. And, because she had sacrificed for me to be at that moment. Uh, you know, my dad did as well. And, you know, to have, you know, at the time, you know, my, my family there and friends and the girlfriend and family and all that, it was probably one of the biggest sides of relief that I've had um, in my lifetime uh, with all the odds stacked against me. Um, you know, Tallahassee, Florida, small town kid, grew up in a dorm room, was always rejected ever since elementary school, middle school and high school and college that I was not good enough, too short to play the position um, and to get drafted as a black man at quarterback um, that was that was literally for anyone who thought that they couldn't do or fulfill their dreams like no matter what people say you still can go do this right and I fought for it I've turned down Alabama I've turned down Michigan I turned down uh, you know Florida State LSU to do what I wanted to do and pursue my dream as a quarterback uh, so that meant a lot to me to get drafted uh, to, to not just in the NFL team, but this team went to the Super Bowl the year before. So I got drafted to the top two teams, in the, one of the top two teams in the, in, in the NFL. Um, 
you know, so to go to San Francisco and have that moment, man, it it uh it meant everything to me because I can literally tell people like you can do what you want to do if you just pick the right path, you know, say no to this or stay away from that or put your energy over here instead of over here. Um, you know, those decisions are never hard and you never know what that looks like because trust me when I tell you depression, uh, mental health, all those types of things crept into me from November to April. November is broken ankle, April is a drive. So I don't know what this time period was going to look like for me moving forward what my future is going to look like so that was a dark space um but with the my faith religion my parents my family the support I had around me allowed me to kind of wake up a little bit and say okay here's where you are but you still have the potential to go be somewhere else so Gina it's where I want everybody to understand that when BJ just mentioned faith you have to have it no matter what listen we I wish I could have been a millionaire. I'm not, but that's not the road that I'm supposed to go. I've I've helped many people. I continue to help people. That's just what I do. I've been doing it all my life. I've gotten stomped on, stepped over. I can't tell you how many knives I had to pull out my back. Right now, I probably look like Swiss cheese at this point. <laughs> but you keep pushing because ultimately, there's a goal that we all want to be at in life. As you mentioned, as far as getting the call, and, and it's funny how Jim Harbaugh was the coach of San Fran. Right. Now this year, it turned out to be the, the coach for San Diego. Yep. Um, which, <clears throat> that experience alone, just be able to, to speak to NFL head coach, and he's your first one. But then the second one comes when you get everything set up in San Fran, right. you're ready to roll, and then all of a sudden you get different news, and you get a different call from somebody else. Yeah, um, so, I, so I make the team in San Francisco. So I, I actually go to a training camp with Colin Kaepernick, uh, Seneca Wallace, who was a 12-year veteran from Iowa State, um, Bill McCoy, who was a second-round quarterback from the University of Texas, and Scott Tolzien, who had played at um, Wisconsin. All of these guys have been in the NFL for at least four years or above. Uh, you got Cole McCoy, who's a, you know seven years in. Colin Kaepernick was three, um, but he was a starter. Um, Scott Tolzien had been in for 10, and I went in there as a rookie. And uh, it was just amazing that, you know, after all I had been through to get to that point to play um, in preseason games, I I did what I could do, and I did enough uh, to make that football team. So I made the team in San Francisco as their third quarterback um, as a rookie. Uh, Me, uh, uh, Colin Kaepernick, and Colt McCoy. And... um, uh, it was amazing to make that team. I was there for five weeks. Um, but the way the NFL works is it's a business. So um, they ended up cutting me and taking me from the 53-man roster to practice squad. So during that process, they have to put me on waivers. So that means in 24 hours, I'm not with any team um, because they're trying to demote me to practice squad. So obviously, practice squad means you don't play. Uh, your check is cut in a, into a third of what you were making. And... Um, to be cut for the first time, I really thought I would just be going home uh, because they don't have to bring you back. Right. It's not a guarantee. So, um, you know, to be cut in San Francisco and then, you know, 24 hours comes around, 12 noon of the next day is the cutoff to where San Fran makes the decision to bring you back for a practice squad player or they just let you go completely. Um, I got a call from Pete Carroll with the Seattle Seahawks at 1130. So 30 minutes before the deadline. Uh, Pete Carroll asked me if I wanted to be a Seahawk, and um, I told him yes without a doubt. I mean, at the end of the day, Colin Kaepernick was a mobile quarterback, and I enjoyed being around him and his athletic ability. Um, but more of the mode of what Russell Wilson fits uh, was more of what um, and who I embodied. Um, you know, throughout my college career, a shorter black quarterback, tough, uh, very mobile, un- you know, semi undersized from other people's measurements, not by mine. Um, <laughs> But it just fit. Um, it just fit. And Seattle was always the team that um, played with underdogs. You know, people who, you know, I call us a bunch of myth- misfits. You know, when you think about the dynamics of everything that it entailed from Colin, Ka- from, excuse me, Marshawn Lynch to Russell Wilson to Earl Thomas, Cam Chancellor, Richard Sherman. I mean, these guys, you can, people have all these public opinions about them, but Marshawn Lynch with the Cal Berkeley, he has a degree from Cal Berkeley. He's not an idiot. Right. You know, uh, Richard Sherman went to uh, Stanford, uh, Stanford graduate, Doug Baldwin, Stanford graduate. Um, 
you know, Cam Chancellor, the enforcer, this 6'4", 230-pound free safety, graduate of Virginia Tech, um, technical school. Like, so there's a lot of people on that team that may not have fit, fit the mold based off their size, stature, their background, where they grew up from, whether it's Oakland, California, or Los Angeles, um, or Compton, or, or Russell's from Virginia Beach. Um, I'm from Tallahassee. Like, this, this dynamic of, of individuals, um, you know, created the, uh, was a fire. It was a very feisty and fiery team. And I I felt like going to Seattle was a no-brainer for me. Uh, it just it just fit. So Did anybody, because we think about it now, where Seattle was like kind of sort of on the map, mm-hmm. but not really. Then Pete Carroll obviously left from USC, goes over to Seattle. Mm-hmm. At, in that season, as things were progressing, right? Did it ever hit any of you guys, you, Marshawn, anybody? Did did you guys start feeling with Russell Wilson that we could get maybe possibly to the Super Bowl? Did you guys have that feeling at all that season? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean. In practice, man, we fought, <laughs> and I'm not, I mean, literally, we fought each other. We we, we had this thing about holding each other accountable and knowing that this is not going to last forever. Um, a lot of us are on our second team, including myself, you know, or we're undrafted or we're drafted low um, or we're doubted, and we knew we had something special, and at the end of the day, it was this thing of like we all fought to just get to this moment. So there's no way we're going to get to this moment and still not continue to fight um, to stamp our names. Um, that's part of the reason I came to USF in the first place. Um, I didn't want to be go to another college and be another number. I wanted to come here and make a name for myself so that when I come back, um, not only am I recognized, but I'm able to do things and maneuver within this 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 realm of, okay, he did something special here while he was here with his time. And that's what we all felt like when we were going to be in Seattle. So it got down to a point where, you know, even if I, even if Russell was starting and I was the backup quarterback, if I was in practice, I had to know what was going on. And I had to know exactly what Russell knew because if I look to my right and Marshawn is my running back and we're not on the same page, then we're not holding each other accountable. We're not helping each other get better. And it got to that point where we were just so in tune with helping each other and making sure we were you know, doing what we're supposed to do on and off the field that I promise you it was the only team I've ever been on where we knew we were going to win each game. We just were trying to figure out how and by how much. It literally became to that point, yeah, we're going to win because of what we've put into this. Right. Um, are we going to win by a touchdown or a field goal or are we going to win by 20 points or 10? It didn't matter. We just knew that everybody on the field was all connected and tied, that we all were going to make sure that we were going to be successful because this was our moment. So, after after Super Bowl, we know there's always a there's a party for you guys. Yeah. Uh, afterwards, everybody gets that moment to celebrate. How many days after it was over? Either a where it really sunk in, like I'm a rookie in the NFL. Mm. You know, I get to the big game, win and winning it all. Yeah. And then what's the feeling like? Just in, and like I said, it's days after everything mm. already happened. When did it finally like really sink in? Like I'm a Super Bowl champion quarterback. I mean, it, 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 it's it's uh, March 28th, May 28th, <laughs> uh, March 28th. Yeah, it's still you know to this day. Um, when I hear other people say it, it reminds me. I don't think of it that much anymore. I think about my experiences in the locker room and the teammates and. Um, you know, it still hits me to this day if I'm speaking to kids and someone introduced me, okay, we have Super Bowl champion B.J. Daniels here to speak to you guys. I mean, it's not something I ever could have truly imagined because that's not why I wanted to play football. It wasn't to become a Super Bowl champion ever. Right. Um, you know, I wanted to play the game that I loved, and I wanted to travel the world and do all these things through this sport, and I was awarded these opportunities, and those are the things I hold and cherish the most. Um the Super Bowl part, I mean, it's it's something that happened so fast. I mean, there was so much going on, you know, from being around celebrities to being in downtown New York City to, you know, we're the, we're the A-listers. You know, they're holding the line for, you know, other famous people that I admire. I want their autograph. I want pictures with those people, and they're letting us go in first. Like, those, there was so much that happened that I, I still have to – reflect on it and think about it like how amazing that really was and um but it, it it what it did do and what we all agreed 
you know, as, as players, is that if we accomplish this feat, then our name will be stamped in Seattle forever. And there will also be a tag attached to our last name that will mean something forever. Um, Seattle's first Super Bowl team, Seattle's only Super Bowl team. Um, you know, my last name, you know, Daniels, I mean, even my father, he he's reaping the benefits of the fact that he has a son that played in the, in the Super Bowl. Right. So it's, it, it's things that still are happening, um, and I'm still trying to absorb it all and take it all in because um, – it, it really was a, a, a crazy moment for me. It wasn't my number one goal, um, but trust me when I tell you, it's it's been a it was a blessing and something I'm very thankful for. Uh, this is I want everybody to understand. I we used the word humble earlier. <laughs> and I'm gonna use it again because you just listen how he talked about it. It's it's not a big deal. And and believe me, this is why I said I think that's why everybody gravitates towards you because of the humbleness. And and you're absolutely right though because not everybody gets that opportunity. And if you really kind of think about it full circle here in life, I'm originally from Philly. You're down in Tallahassee. Mm -hmm. There's a whatever third world or third thing kind of dimension that happens that you end up winning the Super Bowl in Seattle. But your alma mater is here in USF. Mm -hmm. And then from the Philly kid, the Tallahassee kid, to then come together here in Tampa, it it means a lot. Because that means to me that whatever you do in life, you shouldn't give up no matter what. You are going to, I mean, there's going to be everything thrown your way no matter what it is. Every different ethnicity has things and more challenges that end up posting. Right. And then we hear a lot of times, too, people say, well, this certain ethnicity has privilege over the other one. No, you have to work your behind off to then, if you want to use that as a, a thing where, okay, because I'm black, because I'm Hispanic, because I'm Asian, then if that also catapults you to the forefront because you're using that as another element to where you need to be, I think people, when they say that, some people will be like, oh my God, here we, we have to hear this again. And it's not about that. It's because people don't know the different challenges and all the different ethnicities that you have to come through in order to be where you are. But the one thing I want to get back to before we end the conversation here is Marshawn Lynch. Yeah. He's, as you said, right, graduated from Berkeley. When we saw him, what the, what the media wanted to put out then, when he talked about, I'm just here, so I'm going to find... Mm-hmm. Hey, I'm just here so I don't get fined, so y'all can sit here and ask me all the questions y'all want to. I'm going to answer with the same answer, so y'all can shoot if y'all please. I'm here so I won't get fined. Because, uh, you know, you have the media moment where you have to talk to, to right. the media folks. But he was painting this picture like this, you know, this tough guy. You know, the only thing that we knew about it, he liked to kid around with Skittles. Mm. That was a big thing. You being a teammate and then becoming to know Marshawn as a man. What can you say to everybody who's listening in to this conversation? Yeah. Something different that maybe all of us don't know because we just see him now. It's, we see it a whole different side of him, but maybe something that none of us saw that you had seen when you yeah. were a teammate. I mean, Marshawn's a very loyal person. Um, you know, it's funny. I don't think you can find on any interview anywhere of anyone saying anything negative about Marshawn that was a teammate of his. Um, not one. And the the crazy part about it is the people that want to portray things or say things are not in the locker room with us. They don't see him every day. You know, they take snippets and moments and things where they don't truly understand. Um, You know, there are some things about him that um, have been engraved in him ever since he was a family, uh, excuse me, ever since he was a young kid in Oakland, California, uh, which is loyalty and love, and that's something that he always moves in. Um, He's someone I can FaceTime right now if I wanted to. I can call his mother and talk to her, which I did probably two weeks ago. Um, Marshawn called my mother um, about a month ago just to check on her, um, to have a conversation. And the, the, the thing is, he's a very family-oriented person, and he's very loyal. If you cross him, that's when he's done. And I think a lot of people um, should understand that. Um, you know, if you think about your own life experiences and the things that you've either faced or gone through with people, mm-hmm. um, you know, with the media aspect, you know, I know for a fact that Marshawn has said this on camera, uh, which I don't think a lot of people paid attention to, but they should have. Um, when he was in Buffalo, he was portrayed to be this type of person. And it happened, and he actually felt some type of way or offended by a reporter. Okay, cool, I'm done with all reporters. Because you're going to create a narrative in a situation where you already have your story. You just need my quotes. Right. And I don't think people understand that when it comes to interviewing. That's how that works. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, for him to not want to talk to the media and just focus on football, what's wrong with that? 
nothing wrong with that. You know, but that's what people, you know, oh no, he needs to talk. Why? Because you want to hear him talk? <laughs> why? Why? Right. Um, the moment of the Super Bowl for him saying, I'm just here so I don't get fined. He had been fined on multiple occasions for not being present, not being available. Okay. Once it's the media comes out in the locker room and tries to interview everybody, he's gone. Okay, cool. So the NFL now finds you for not being available. Okay, so Marshawn's tactic, I will be there. I'm going to sit there. I'm going to be available for the two-minute time that you have required me to by contract. But I'm going to say what I want to say. And that was the truth. None of us thought that that moment would blow up to what it did. I mean, I remember laughing about it after everyone was like, man, Marshawn is funny, man. He just kept saying the same thing over again. I was like, okay, whatever. Right. You know, that's Marshawn. Like, I, you know, but then that moment turned into something so much bigger. I'm just here so I don't get fined. That was his honest truth, <laughs> you know, but it turned into a moment where it was just, you know, the media ran with that as well, you know, and turned it into whatever narrative they wanted to funny or, you know, I can't believe this or, you know, you know, now it's a T-shirt. I mean, it just turned into a slogan. Like it's a thing. It did, it's a mem- right? memorable moment now. Um, that was just him being him. And that's who he is. I mean, Marshall, the personality you see about Marshawn today, which everyone is so captivated by, the same guy I've been in the locker room with for the last, I mean, since 2013. Uh, the last thing I want to leave everybody with, because this is not the last conversation between mm-hmm. myself and BJ, because we're going to hope to be back here. Obviously, spring training football is, is about to happen. Um, but looking back, and, and I want to kind of take everybody back here. And the reason why, let me get to this first, though. The reason why I want to say it, we did drills on the other end. And when I'm telling you this, man, listen, right now, the uh-huh. UFL, anybody can can call this man right now, and, and I'm pretty sure he's ready to play. So we're not, we're not going to be done with the conversation yet. Take me just for a moment. When we walk through the hallway, again, leave it out of your office. We're coming down the corridor. Yeah. Your name is up on that board. Yeah. Where I can, it's just me just pointing to it like I'm just about to speak to this man right here. Yeah. And it's different for me from the media side of the house. What does it mean, to, again, to come back here to USF where, where it all started for you, other than your high school time, and then seeing your name up there on that board? I mean, it means a lot. Um, I think it means more now that these people, these players can see my name um, on that board because if I wasn't here, um, you know, let's say I was at Ohio State, I wouldn't have the same amount of credibility. Um, you know, not because I'm not a, a an Ohio State graduate. So the fact that I went to this university, you know, and some of these kids come in from the transfer portal or come in from junior college or high school or things like that, they see me. Um, you know, but I, I don't press them as much. Um, eventually, these new the new players that come in. I let the current players tell them about me. I let the current players kind of say, yeah, BJ's a, a good dude and you should probably, you know, and then I let my name being on that board uh, represent some credibility and proof. Oh, okay, he, he he went to the NFL. Oh, he's in the Super Bowl, okay. And then I allow those guys to finally come in on their own time, come communicate with me. If I was at a different school, I wouldn't have that same amount of credibility. So the fact that my name is on the wall here, um, I'm thankful for it. Um, but I think it it just adds to the mystique of I'm here to help you. Right. And I actually can, I actually have things at this university that can prove that I've actually done some of the things that I can actually tell you about or I've been some of the places that you want to go. Um, so for me, uh, you know, I my name was up there twice and uh, I've been to three Super Bowls. And I never complain about them missing my name on one of them. And just recently, they changed it um, to where I was there for two Super Bowls with Seattle and one with Atlanta. And I promise you, it didn't mean that much to me. But I know that, like I said, it adds credibility to those young men um, who see themselves one day being in a position that I was in. Well, we're going to get back to the other conversation. I know BJ has to run here, but we're going to get back to that conversation by the second one. Okay. About the second one, so we're going to leave it there. But, no, we're definitely we're going to come back, and hopefully, like I said, the drill. You guys got to see this, even if I don't run the drill, because Lord knows <clears throat> these legs <laughs> may not keep up as much as BJ. But it was fun because of the drill. I asked you a question about Jalen Hurts, and we'll get into it a little bit later on. The spring football is about to happen. And I want people to understand the question I asked you beforehand, because we're you know, out of time here at the moment. But what you made me see that 
I don't see us as armchair quarterbacks. When we're, you know, sitting in front of the TV right. or in the stands, it's different than what you explain to me. So we'll have that conversation coming in the future with BJ. Listen, Great. I appreciate the time. Thank appreciate you so much. You. Thank you. It was, you guys have no idea the feeling that I have, even though he's humble, the feeling that I have just speaking to him because that humbleness, that faith, that God's spirit comes out. And he may not know it, but he's touched so many different people that you guys, you'll start feeling it after you see this conversation. So thank you, everyone. Again, I'm Angel Martinez, Martinez Company and Riptide Media, and we will see you on the next one.